Um, so this talk is based on a paper called The Relationship Between COBOL and Computer Science by Ben Schneiderman. But it's also strongly influenced by Jean Samet's early history of COBOL, which was a paper that she wrote uh, in the 1980s reflecting on her time on the COBOL Short Range Committee. So let's get this out of the way. Um, the relationship between COBOL and academia has always been and still is a little bit frosty. Uh, and we're going to get into kind of some of the reasons for that. Schneiderman's paper presents three perspectives on why that relationship is so fraught. He offers a historical, technical, and what he calls a social psychological uh, analysis of the relationship. The purpose of this talk is really more to give you some background about COBOL so that you can understand what Schneiderman's talking about, so that if you want to go back and read the paper, you'll understand what's happening in the paper. So first, let's spend a little bit of time talking about the early history of COBOL. Um, in April 1959, uh, at a meeting of computer people at the University of Pennsylvania <laughs> Computer Center, there was a discussion of the need for a machine-independent common language. There was a follow-up meeting in May 1959 uh, to further discuss this need really for specifically a common business language. Uh, the participants included government and industry employees and consultants. Um, there were about 40 participants, uh, like, as you can see from this, most of them were from government or from manufacturers. Academia really wasn't very well represented in this meeting. Um, three committees were created to develop the programming language. There was the executive committee, the sh um, short range committee, and the long range committee. Uh, and there were members from these organizations that I have listed here. As you can see from the list of organizations, there's really not a lot of academic rep representation. The closest we've got is USA Signal Corps ADPS School, which I think might have been the aeronautical department, but I'm still not exactly sure. Um, June through December of 1959, the Short Range Committee explored language options to recommend a short range composite approach uh, that would guide the work of the larger committee for the next two years. So effectively, they were looking at the existing programming languages and trying to figure out a way to kind of meld them together to have something that would get them through the next couple of years. Um, so Samet in her paper uh, basically says that the short range committee believed that their work would be used by the intermediate range committee, which would have time to develop a really good language. Um, <laughs> That didn't really happen. <coughs> uh, the recommendations of the Short Range Committee pretty much turned into COBOL. Uh, Samet notes that had the Short Range Committee realized just how long their work would be used, they probably would have gone about their task differently. I'm sure we can all relate to that. Um, so a lot of work is done in uh, 1960 to develop some compilers based on uh, the recommendations of the Short Range Committee. And in December 1960, the same program runs on two different computers. At that point, COBOL is the first real cross-platform language. Uh, fast forward a little bit to August 1961. COBOL, a sample problem, appears in the communications of the ACM. Uh, it's seven pages long. It's two and a half pages of flowcharts, three pages of code. And there are zero references to other works. So, you know, if you're looking at this from a historical academic perspective, eh. uh, May 1962, Communications of the ACM puts out the COBOL issue. 13 articles about COBOL, only four of those articles have references uh, to previous works. So, you know, this is kind of COBOL's coming out, it's, it's, it's ball, uh, and it comes out and basically uh, kind of to academia. So let's talk about COBOL a little bit as a technology. Um, in order to understand COBOL, it helps to understand the goals that led to its creation. So first of all, there was a desire to solve business problems. And at that time, business problems were mostly reading records in from a few files, processing those records, and then writing some more records out to another file. 
So you might have something that uh, correlated some employee names to some projects and gave you a head count so that you could look and say, oh, nobody's working on the kitten toes project, let's cut that one. Um, secondly, people wanted a, a cross-platform or a common language, uh, one that could run on many different computers. You had a lot of manufacturers, they were building all kinds of different architectures, and there, there wasn't really a way to you know, spend your time writing one program that could then easily run on another computer. Uh, the idea was to have something that you could write once and run anywhere, which, <laughs> again, eh, some of you. Uh, there was a desire to have an English-like language because it was thought that having an English-like language would broaden the number of people who could communicate a problem to a computer. Uh, so I have an example of a perform statement here. Uh, perform report generation until in sample data. You can kind of pretend like that's an imperative English sentence, maybe somebody yelling at you. Um, <laughs> But you can, you, can, you can kind of read it and you can say, okay, I maybe have an idea of what this person is rather rudely demanding I do. Uh, and the idea, <coughs> final idea really was to have a verb-based language, an imperative language, uh, with as few verbs uh, as possible, uh, with as many options, rather than having a large number of verbs with a few options. And so one of the consequences of this that I'll talk about a little more is that you kind of end up with this explosion of syntax around getting a small number of verbs to do a lot of different things. COBOL programs are hierarchical. Uh, there are divisions. There are four divisions in a program, the identification, environment, data, and procedure divisions. Each division has some sections. Sections can have paragraphs. Paragraphs are made up of sentences, and sentences contain statements. So let's look at a COBOL program. As mentioned, we have the four different divisions. So I'm gonna break it out uh, over on the right. Um, the identification division is where the programmer specifies things like the program name. Uh, it can also hold the name of the author and the date the program was written. Um, the environment division. This is where environment specific information lives and when COBOL was originally created, things like file names were environment specific. You know, you had somebody go get the reel and put it on the machine. Um, the idea was effectively that anything that was environment or machine specific would live in this section so that if you did need to make any changes, you only had to change them in one place. Uh, the next division is the data division. So the data division defines the structure of the input and output records in the file section. So this basically says, here's what things in the files that we're using for input and output are going to look like. Uh, records are hierarchical. So in this example here, sample name um, encompasses both the first name and last name field. So you could use sample name to refer to both fields at the same time. Uh, the working storage section defines variables and constants. Uh, originally, and for a long time, all variables and constants were global. The procedure division contains the logic of the program. Uh, this particular program reads input records with names and birth dates and prints out records of names and the generation that that person was from. So it'll tell you if you're a millennial or Gen X or a boomer or it doesn't really care beyond that. Um, if there's anyone who's older than that, you are very important. I just didn't have time to keep writing if statements. Um, so the program is broken up, th this program is broken up into two paragraphs, uh, one called begin and the other one called report generation. Uh, the sentences in the paragraph are indented, so anything that's indented under that label is a sentence within that paragraph. So white space becomes significant. Um, and we still have that to this day. Um, so the heart of a lot of most COBOL programs is this perform verb, uh, and effectively it's a subroutine call. So in this incarnation we're saying, we're, we use the until modifier, and it acts as a while statement. It does the report generation until the sentinel value of in sample data is set to true, which happens there uh, at the end when it's done reading that file. 
Uh, take a look at this nested if statement here. Uh, one thing about early COBOL was that periods ended each sentence. In this case, uh, if you left off the period at the end of this example, you would end up including that next line, the display first name space last name space generation in your else statement, and that would probably be a bug. This kind of bug was really hard to spot because periods are a little hard to see. It was also really easy to introduce. If you forgot a period, suddenly your program just you know, went off and did its own thing. Uh, later versions of COBOL added things like end if, end procedure, and, and basically end statements that could be used instead of periods to make the code much easier to read, albeit maybe a little more difficult to write if you had a hard time typing six more characters. Um, there were some common technical complaints about the language. Uh, early versions of the language had only one string processing verb called inspect. And the only thing it could do was tally the number of occurrences of a substring and do a simple find and replace. So originally there was this idea to write a self-hosting COBOL compiler in COBOL and um, that would have been really hard. <laughs> uh, every sentence could end with and go to. Uh, which led to code that was kind of hard to follow. <laughs> that, that looked a lot nicer um, originally, but okay, you get the idea. Uh, all variables were global. You didn't have any local variables. Uh, this made it important to coordinate work between programmers who were working on the same program. Uh, there were no parameterized procedure calls, uh, only subroutine calls via perform. Uh, you, recursion wasn't supported. Uh, there was discussion of having a mathematical notation of function calls, but that was rejected early on because it was seen as something that was just too difficult for non-mathematicians to understand. Uh, okay, so that kind of ends the technical discussion. Uh, <laughs> Schneiderman also proposes what he calls the social and psychological reasons uh, that the computer science community rejected COBOL. Um, one of them was that data processing wasn't really seen as an interesting problem. Uh, computer scientists, computer engineers of the day were, you know, looking at how galaxies formed and modeling physical systems and things like that. COBOL was really more concerned with payroll and, you know, <laughs> report generation. Um, this wasn't seen as a serious academic pursuit. Uh, professors also felt that <coughs> uh, COBOL because it was widely used in the industry, wasn't really worth teaching. They felt that if they started teaching COBOL, they would effectively become trade schools uh, that simply prepared students for jobs. Um, COBOL's English-like syntax was ragged on a lot. It, it seemed imprecise and unscientific to a lot of people. So in the end, what can we say about COBOL? Um, it was created uh, with almost no input from academic computer science. Uh, in many ways, uh, such as the decision to not include functions, it actually actively avoided interacting with computer science. Uh, COBOL was widely adopted and used. Um, it was good enough, and it had the backing of some of the biggest and most powerful organizations in the country, in the world even at that time. Uh, in some ways, the popularity of COBOL undermined it in the eyes of academics. COBOL was a fl flawed language. If you read Samet's paper or you read any other uh, papers from some of the people who worked on the original COBOL specification and compilers, they talk about a lot of things that they would have done differently. However, it's important to remember that many of the decisions made sense at the time in the late 1950s and the early 1960s, and it wouldn't be until years later that people looked at some of these things and said, oh, this was the wrong thing to do. Um, Anyway, that's what I've got. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate you all uh, humoring me. Thank you again to Papers We Love, to Sigma, William Bird. Um, yeah, and uh, I guess, are there, do you want to do any questions or have I run? Very a brief questions. Very brief if questions. you have you know, one sentence questions that he can give two sentence answers to, that would be great. Yeah, make sure to include a period at the end. Exactly. <laughs> one back there. Uh, there's Mike coming to you. Hold on, wait for Mike. Is it Turing complete? Yes. Okay. You can theoretically implement any program in COBOL? Yes. Yikes. That's terrifying to think about. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions? Uh, one in the back. Uh, I think one of you is going to make it there. 
One of your slides had a date with the year 17. Would that have been read as 1917? Yeah, I kind of cheated on that. Um, I'm not sure what modern compilers do with that. Uh, as of a compiler written in 19, you know, 70 or 80, yeah, it probably would have been read as 1917. Implementation specific. Uh, a print. Oh, hang on. Wait till the wait till the mic. Sorry. Uh, the example of a report th yeah. that showed up made me think that, oh, this is why we created CSV files, because everything is just, you know, individually spaced delimited. They say this, this bit is, you know. Yeah, I mean, um, effectively, th these are, COBOL made the assumption that all of your records, initially COBOL made the assumption that all of your records would be fixed with uh, formats. So. Yeah, you could see it as a precursor to a CSV file. On the other hand, if anybody's ever written a CSV parser, yeah. maybe something like this actually is appealing. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I know absolutely nothing about computer science and its history, but was there a similar academic rejection of like SQL because it was used by businesses and English E and not having things? That's a good question. Um, I don't know a specific answer for you, although I will say that SQL was based on, you know, more database research and database theory, and so I think it was probably a little more widely accepted as something that had a theoretical underpinning. I think that's it. Thank you very much. One more round of applause. Thank you.